Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to our webinar today on biofabrication, uh, introducing sustainable biomaterials organized by Ashley Innovate in partnership with Synergy. My name is Brian, and for those of you who don't know about us, we are a government-backed investor in Singapore with the mission to build deep tech innovations in AI, biotech, healthcare, food tech, agri-tech, and more. At SG Innovate, our work involves connecting with the global deep tech ecosystem, working with entrepreneurial scientists to bring their innovative research from lab to market, as well as developing deep tech talent. Today, we have an amazing panel of speakers who will be sharing their knowledge on sustainable biomaterials. I would also like to encourage our audience here today to share their thoughts on this topic and engage with our speakers by using the Q&A box below. Uh, and now with no further ado, I will now pass the other time to our moderator for today, uh, Costas, who will get us started. Costas, please. Hello everyone, and nice to see some very fam some familiar names uh, on the attendance uh, list. I am Costas Vavitas, and uh, this event is also a chance for me to introduce myself uh, in the Singapore and Asian ecosystem. I am the manager of Synergy. Synergy is the Synthetic Biology Consortium of Synthetic Biology, and our mandate is to make uh, connections between academics, industry, that lead to applications, and then uh, make an ecosystem around the broad field of synthetic biology. Today's topic is one of my favorite ones. It's about new biomaterials and biofabrication. And it's indeed uh, true that nature is rich in uh, biomaterials, in uh, ways to combine biomolecules and create uh, amazing uh, combinations that give uh, properties that we cannot even imagine. Uh, we have a great uh, panel today. We have uh, two industry uh, presenters. And since it's quite a new field, we take the opportunity to uh, introduce, let them introduce themselves and the companies to the community. So we will do two uh, presentations by David and Lips. Our first speaker for today is David Lips, who moved all the way from Netherlands to Japan back in 2017 to join uh, Spiber. Spiber is a Japanese bio biomaterials company that is developing new materials for industrial and consumer use based, uh, based on recombinant proteins. I would uh, let David introduce himself a bit further and do his presentation. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, first of all, thanks to SGI Innovate and Synergy for hosting this event and inviting me again. Um, I think I did one last year with you guys as well. That was a lot of fun. So excited to be here. Um, yeah, my name is David. I've been with Spiber in Japan for the past three and a half years now. Um, working as a researcher on uh, various R&D projects, but recently also on um, our new sustainability team on uh, sustainable sourcing and procurement, which has been very interesting as well. Um, I'm going to get started with the presentation and share my screen. Um, desktop 2, and there we go. Is that coming up all right? Perfect. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, biofabrication, introducing sustainable materials. Um, I'll be demonstrating or talking about the, the case study that I suppose is uh, Spiber. Um, Spiber has been around for a while now, since 2007. It's grown to a pretty big size over the last couple of years. Um, I think we are now 250 plus members in Japan. And we're located in the city of uh, Tsudaoka, which is in uh, Yamagata Prefecture, Northern Mainland, uh, Japan. Uh, as of recently, we also have entities in, in Thailand and, and the US. I'll touch upon those very briefly uh, later on. But we're all here working on this uh, molecule to material platform, um, trying to create materials that, that meet characteristics like this, that are renewable, uh, biodegradable, have a low carbon footprint, are customizable, and importantly, are also cost competitive. And the way we're approaching making these, these materials is through so-called structural proteins. So structural proteins are materials found in nature. Um, we're all very familiar with these kinds of materials. Uh, keratin in your hair, in your nails is a structural protein. Uh, collagen in leather would be another example of a structural protein. 
uh, silk proteins in, in spider webs, uh, resilient in the legs of, legs of this, this grasshopper that allows it to jump incredibly far due to the uh, elasticity of that protein material. Uh, this muscle has an incredible uh, arrangement of proteins that allow it to attach under, underwater uh, with strong adhesion to things like rocks, uh, remarkable properties that we have not been able to replicate in terms of underwater adhesives. Um, and there's a whole list of these materials, right? These are all materials that have been very carefully fine-tuned by, by natural selection over a period of, of millions of years to, to perform really well in their respective uh, niches. And they can also be incredibly useful for, for humans if we had ways to access and, and tap into more of these proteins uh, at scale in an environmentally friendly way. Of course, we're using some protein materials already, uh, wool, uh, silk, uh, cashmere, but these all involve uh, animal farming practices that um, also come with their own negative externalities. And, and many of these other proteins are, are much harder to tap into than that. Um, if we look under the hood, though, proteins, of course, are these, these sequences of amino acids um, that are constructed based on genetic instructions encoded in the DNA of the organisms that make these, these materials. And um, through uh, biotechnology, we've now you know, been able for, for a couple of decades now to, to copy and paste and, and manipulate and, and sort of redesign this this genetic sequence and, and port it into uh, microbial cell factories and and use those as platforms to create um, various proteins for, for human applications, starting with uh, mostly therapeutics, but now finally also reaching into other areas like, like materials. And that's very useful for um, materials like spider silk, for example, uh, incredible as they might be from a mechanical property perspective, they're, they're hard to access at scale, right? Far, uh, sp fibers, um, Spiders can't be farmed. They, they eat each other if they, they live in close proximity. Um, people have tried to, to make stuff out of spider silk from actual spiders. Uh, this is one example, this, this golden dress, um, a piece of art that hundreds of, of people have worked on for, for several years, uh, harvesting uh, over a million spiders, I believe. Um, incredible achievement, a beautiful piece of, uh, of clothing that is now up in a museum for, for exhibition, but not very scalable. So that's where we bring in biotechnology, where we apply a fairly straightforward process um, in, in the way I just described, where you take sort of the software in the form of genetic instructions of making these, these proteins, you put those into um, a genetically engineered microbe, um, the microbial cell factory, if you will. Uh, you put that in a giant steel tank with sugars from renewable biomass that are then fermented to make the target product, in this case, the target uh, material. And uh, that target material, the target products can then be processed in, in various ways to, to make a variety of material formats. So that in a nutshell is uh, sort of the spiber platform, molecule to material. We have that all vertically integrated here in our facility in, in Japan in a pilot scale, and it's data driven uh, by a production platform. Zooming in just a little bit, um, it's interesting. We start with uh, sort of inspiration from nature, literally by going out into the field and, and collecting these, these samples here in Japan, but also abroad with our academic collaborators where we analyze um, protein materials like spider silk for their mechanical properties. We look at their tensile strength, their, their strain capacity, their toughness. And at the same time, we sequence the, the organisms that produce these materials so we can look at the amino acid sequence that encodes these protein materials and start looking for, for correlations between, between sequences and mechanical properties that we can use as inspiration for new iterations of uh, materials that we want to build um, in the context of, of specific application areas. Of course, it's it's not very straightforward to go from a sequence to a mechanical property. There's there's many variables that come into play in endowing a material with its uh, specific mechanical properties. Nevertheless, if you look at a lot of these sequences and a lot of these me mechanical properties, you can start to see correlations between specific sequence motifs, short snippets of uh, amino acids and their uh, the number, their frequency of, of occurrence within the sequence and specific uh, trends in, in mechanical performance. So um, using those, those correlations, you can start to um, use those uh, for 
new sequence design, and that forms sort of the basis for for this this platform that I just described. Where we start with that inspiration from nature, we we come up with a protein design for an application that is sort of encoded in genetic instructions, a DNA sequence. We synthesize those genes, we put them into the microbial host, we ferment, we purify the proteins from from the microbial broth after fermentation. And you end up with a powder that you can then process into a variety of materials. Um, when we started this um, back in the day, we were doing this at very small scales. This was a very impressive achievement back then. Now we have the pilot scale where we can um, produce tons of, of these protein materials uh, every year and um, are scaling up even further. So with these proteins, once we fermented and purified them, we can make a variety of materials. Here are some examples, uh, fibers, fluffy stuff, uh, films, foams, resins. Uh, we name all these materials brood protein, and we've been using them in, in different application areas, mostly focusing on the apparel and the automobile industry. And I'll briefly go over some examples uh, in each to give sort of a, um, a glimpse of the types of products that you can actually bring to market with these, these materials. Um, this is the first limited release that we did, uh, I think in 2019 with uh, Goldwyn, our trusted apparel partner, which owns the North Face uh, Japan. And uh, together we released this, this t-shirt, uh, a blend of cotton and brute protein, and, and really sort of the first point of contact for, for our consumer base here uh, with these, these new materials that you know, have been fermented in, in giant steel tanks by genetically engineered microbes. Um, that same year, we also released the, the Moon Parka uh, outdoor jacket. Um, again, a small release, but here really a functional outdoor piece of apparel uh, where the outer shell, the outer layer of this jacket was made of 100% brood protein uh, material. And, and here we had to um, do a bit of, of protein design, if you will, to overcome some of the challenges that are sometimes part of, of using these, these protein materials as they are found in nature. Um, spider webs have this property called super contraction that helps preserve the integrity of the web uh, when in contact with water or in humid environments. It's very useful for, for spiders. Um, it's not so useful for, for apparel applications because um, you don't want your your apparel product to shrink. If you're waiting on the bus and it starts raining, all of a sudden your shirt is way too tight. That is not good. Uh, we wanted to uh, avoid that scenario. So we had to go back to the drawing board a little bit and um, try to engineer and design these proteins towards specific material properties. In this case, water shrinkage reduced. Um, this is still hard to do in a fully predictive manner. You can't just say, okay, I want a material with these and these properties. This is the sequence we need, but using the, uh, chemical properties of the different amino acids, you can start to iterate towards some of these desired properties using this design built test learn cycle that is uh, so characteristic of synthetic biology and biological engineering. So doing that and using sort of the, the data that we've been collecting over the years, we're able to develop fibers that um, have much reduced shrinkage well within the uh, comfort margins of our apparel partner, which are very strict. So we're able to bring this to market successfully and now there's people snowboarding with this, uh, with this jacket. Um, we also have a collaboration with Yui Menakazato, a big name in the world of fashion. Um, he gets invited to the Paris Fashion Week uh, twice a year, apparently one of the bigger events in the world of fashion. And we made these lineups together. Um, this is the first one that we did, the Brute Protein lineup end of 2019, where pretty much all of these, these garments, maybe not including the, the wooden hat and some of the shoes are 100% uh, Brute Protein uh, material, sort of showcasing the, the versatility and, and diversity of, of how you can use these materials in the apparel context. Um, last year, just before Corona started, we, th we did another lineup together, going a bit more towards the, um, I'm not sure what the best word to describe this is, sci-fi, kind of um, aesthetically interesting uh, route. Uh, and in this case, we actually use some of the, uh, the properties of, of the spider silk inspired proteins that we're working with um, and their super contraction to develop processes to sort of fold these, these sheets of textiles that we produce into these, these final shapes using those those properties of, of super contraction. Um, this is the full lineup. If you're interested in, in this kind of stuff, definitely check out his work. He is a uh, fascinating guy and a, and a great designer. We did another show um, very recently. There's a sort of sneak preview in the top right corner over there. Um, we also did a sweater release last year uh, with, with Goldwyn. We have some other projects in the works, leather, fur. We're working on 
human hair, artificial hair, wigs with adherence, one of the larger wig makers in the world, project with Sakai, another designer maybe using our materials in his apparel products as well. So a bunch of stuff going on. Um, I'm going to move quickly because we don't have that much time. In Automobile, we are uh, working with companies like uh, Toyota and, and Bridgestone to develop um, composites for the automobile industry. The timelines here are a bit longer. This R&D takes, takes a bunch of time. There's all sorts of thresholds and, um, and regulations around this. Um, so timelines are a bit longer, but a very promising industry uh, and promising applications where we're trying to develop these composites to essentially reduce the weight of, of some of these car uh, parts in, in the car, like the side panel of the door with a carbon fiber reinforced plastic composite, as well as the foam in this chair with a polyurethane composite, um, while maintaining or even improving uh, some of the mechanical properties of these parts, uh, which would be a big deal if we can pull that off. Um, reduce weight is improved performance, improved environmental performance. So that would be pretty great. Um, yeah, I hope that was a bit of an overview of the different projects, um, functional, outdoor apparel, automobile, different textiles, fashion apparel, and so on. Obviously, this is going to require a, a bunch of material. So scaling up is, is sort of the main priority right now. We have the pilot scale plant in Japan a couple of times per year. Um, we're going to have a demonstration scale plant in Thailand hundreds of tons per year. We just had the opening ceremony last week. Uh, ribbon was cut, um, but from now on, it's going to be a startup process, testing all the equipment and so on. And hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have the first production batches going live. And then we also have the U.S. plant, which is going to follow a couple of years later, 2023, 24. Um, and that's going to be an order of magnitude uh, larger even. Uh, and hopefully that, well, not hopefully, that will allow us to reach uh, an even larger sort of global uh, consumer base and really get these, these materials and these products uh, to market, which is uh, super exciting. Um, I guess lastly, if, if I briefly have time, I'll go over these very quickly because one important question to ask, especially from a sort of sustainability perspective is, you know, what's the point of making these materials, right? Um, are they really more sustainable? What is their, their performance? And, and to really get a sort of quantitative overview of that, that situation so you can answer those questions like, hey, why does this matter? Um, you need to do quantitative uh, analysis. So look at the uh, environmental impacts across different metrics for, for the whole production process and compare them to uh, other materials to see uh, where you stand regarding environmental performance. So this is what we're doing currently for our root protein production process. We're conducting a life uh, cycle analysis um, cradle to gate from raw material to, uh, to, to fibers that can then be used in different products and um, we'll be able to use that to compare to other types of materials. For example, if we want to act sort of as a drop-in replacement to certain animal fibers in the apparel industry, we can compare our uh, environmental performance to those materials as well. Uh, it helps our, our customers, the brands that want to work with our materials to, to, to guide their uh, decision-making. And it allows us to sort of guide our efforts in terms of where do we need to improve our, our production process for, for optimal uh, environmental uh, impact mitigation, if you will. So metrics that we include here are things like global warming potential, greenhouse gas emissions, water use, eutrophication, uh, abiotic resource depletion. We'll probably add a few more in the mix. These are sort of um, yeah, broadly important environmental impact metrics widely used in the fashion industry. Uh, but it is important to really get that holistic picture, which uh, requires you to look at the full process, right? Going from fermentation to transportation to filament production and, and staple fiber production, wastewater treatment, and look at the in and outputs at every step and, uh, and really get a feel for the, for the quantitative, uh, the numbers behind each step for each of these environmental impact metrics so you know how well you're actually doing. Um, this is sort of very initial result. We're still finalizing these analyses. Uh, what you see here is, is cashmere is, is um, pretty bad when it comes to global warming potential, aka CO2 equivalent emissions per kilogram of, of fiber. That's because cashmere goats, um, they, they roam around in, in giant herds in Mongolia. They eat all the, the vegetation and they don't just eat the grass, they eat the whole roots. It, it takes a long time to recover for an ecosystem. Uh, and as a result, the, the carbon cost of, of making cashmere is, uh, is very big. Uh, we're well below that, but you also see there's sort of a range of potential scenarios that have and that result in, in different uh, outcomes for, for our brood protein production process. And, and this is still sort of an early industry, so there's a lot of optimization to be made. But depending on how you arrange your process and the choices you make in terms of where does your energy come from for powering your facilities, what choices do you make when it comes to uh, sourcing the renewable biomass that your production process 
relies on, um, you will end up um, better or worse on the environmental impact spectrum. And uh, it's up to us to make sure that we end up on the right side of this, this graph. Um, very lastly, lastly, end of life is also important, something we're investigating, like there's different ways to get rid of a material. Once you make it, you can recycle it, put it in a, a landfill, compost it. What you can do depends on the properties of the material as well, uh, of course, um, on the infrastructure that is available in a given location. But step one for us is to really understand how do our materials behave in certain environments that they could end up in at the end of their life. So one example of that is these resins that we've been making. They have some excellent mechanical properties compared to other engineering plastics. Uh, and when you put them in the soil, you see significant uh, biodegradation over a period of, of, of three months with differences in, in sort of the speed and the extent of degradation, depending on uh, how the, how the um, resins have been treated. Uh, another one, or you can also add proteases enzyme to speed up that degradation and get to complete degradation within a week. Proteases are enzymes that break down proteins put them in a big bath of proteases and you end up with um, pretty much complete degradation, which is interesting. Uh, and then if you look at the fibers, one of the things we're interested in for both uh, outdoor apparel and sort of uh, fashion apparel stuff is, is we won't want to end up in the same situation where a lot of these uh, fossil based fibers are now in when it comes to uh, microplastic pollution in the ocean. So we're running these degradation experiments, um, strictly ISO standards, where we're comparing the brute protein fibers in marine conditions for their biodegradation characteristics and comparing them to polyester and, and cotton. And what you see is uh, significant degradation for the brute protein fibers in a marine environment, whereas polyester, for example, has pretty much zero uh, biodegradation. And even for more finished fabrics, dyed and spun yarns, you also uh, still see significant biodegradation. So these are early results. We're still investigating this and, and sort of learning about what are the different parameters that we can tune to speed up or slow down this degradation or increase or decrease the extent to which the material is fully degraded. But uh, these are uh, initial data points that I, I wanted to share in the context of this, this, this panel on uh, sustainable uh, biomaterials. Um, but it's, it is important if you're coming into this space to really understand you know, the full life cycle uh, from production to the end of life. So um, yeah, I hope, I hope that sort of um, gave some context around about big words like this, renewable, biodegradable, reduced carbon footprint, and so on. Um, and I hope in general, it gave a bit of an overview of what Spiber is working on. Uh, out here in the Japanese countryside. Um, apologies if it was a bit fast, but I'm sure we'll have uh, some time to talk and answer questions. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for the very nice uh, presentation and also the very nice images of colors and geese from Japan. I would like to introduce you now to our next speaker, uh, who is uh, Adi Reza Nugroho. And he's the co-founder and CEO of MYCL, a biotech startup that produces sustainable materials for the global market. Uh, Adi is based in Indonesia, and he graduated from the School of Architecture in Badun Technology Institute, and he has been passionate about entrepreneurship since his earliest days. So Adi, uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. By the way, uh, we, I look at your questions and also the lively discussion from the Naughty Hump ladies. Uh, we will get to most of them at the end uh, of the, after the presentation during the discussion. So Adi, please. Yeah, so thanks Costas uh, for the warm introduction. So hi everyone. Um, I'm glad to be one of the speakers today at the biofabrication webinar initiated by SG Innovate. Um, so I'm aware this is really quite new technology, uh, biomaterials, uh, but if you saw recently in Netflix a documentary about seaspiracy, cowspiracy, I think <clears throat> we can see how much uh, big, how big is, is the negative impact from cattle farming to the environments that drives demand uh, of the bio-based uh, materials and even food. So today I would like to share uh, our innovations, uh, which I'm wearing it today, like this watch straps and what else? this uh, wallet and even these sneakers. So um, yeah, I think I would like to start um, opening my deck. Got it. Um, yeah, I hope it works well. Yes. So um, 
when we are talking about the fashion industry, it's uh, giving a really huge environmental impact to the world. At least 21 billion tons of CO2 uh, was emitted by this industry. And 38% of it comes from uh, material productions. Um, it's getting worse that um, the end it's getting worse that the animal leather, which comes from cattle farming, is also contribute a lot to the environment. And the, the industry is taking our earth land mass, consume a lot of water, and emitting high CO2 emissions from cow's burp. Um, meanwhile, on the other hand, consumers are shifting. Um, you may aware people are going to plant-based diet, uh, riding electric vehicle, and use less plastic. So these eco-conscious consumption drives the demand of, of vegan leather race and reach almost 90 billion US dollars per year. So in order to tap this, uh, to tap this huge opportunity, uh, we are seeking solution from nature. Um, we call it mylia, mycelium uh, leather, mushroom mycelium leather. And if you're wondering how it's made, um, we're using agricultural waste, anything that is fibrous, um, can use it as a growing mushroom substrate. And after 60 days of growing, we can harvest the mycelium in form of sheet. And the material, it looks and feels like leather after the post treatment. Um, so we supply to the brands and designers to create a beautiful product. Um, so um, so yeah, as a disclaimer, we're not using um, fruiting bodies of the mushrooms that we usually eat, no. So we are using only the mycelium. Um, and the material is really amazing. So no more animal killings. We can harvest it in just 60 days. Uh, it only use a tiny fraction of water. Um, we can grow it vertically and it require less spaces. And after the end of life, we can home compose it in 20.8 weeks. So this is something that we also investigate uh, about the biodegradability. And during the process itself, we don't add any harmful chemical like chromium and heavy metals. So I think I need to change my camera, it's turning off. Um, okay, so... Um, Yeah, so the for, for the past three years, we did product market fit and uh, collaborate with local beauty brands. Usually for local brands, they are very difficult in accessing sustainable material, particularly in Indonesia. Uh, most of them are using um, existing solution, either from animal base or um, uh, synthetic base. Um, so it is very uncommon uh, for them to use a responsible material. However, we got a lot of interest from the brands for doing market demonstration with them. And um, the result is it's amazing after we did a product demonstration. So the first case that we work collaborate, collaboratively with uh, local brands is through Kickstarter campaign. So we work with three uh, local brands who are producing wallet, travel journal, and uh, watches and they never selling the product to overseas market uh, because for some reason, uh, letter sourcing from Indonesia is banned for some countries uh, because most of the local manufacturer, letter local manufacturer are not comply in terms of the post water treatment process. Uh, so that's why some, ban, uh, some country are banning the letter sourcing from Indonesia. But after they are using this mycelium letter, they are successfully run the Kickstarter campaign uh, and able to reach 16 countries and sold their item to 100 buyer in just a month of campaign. And we're glad that we deliver all of the orders by 100% uh, last year during the pandemic. And if you're wondering about how uh, the durability of these materials, the products, so the first, Prototype that I made is uh, two years ago. So I'm using it for uh, for every day. I put it in my pocket, I'm getting wet, getting sweat, 
And surprisingly, in terms of the performance and durability, it's really good. So if I scratch it, there's no scratch mark on it. Um, so we see a really huge potential in this material. And I think it can um, um, disrupting the leather industry in the future. So the second case is our partnership with the local fashion designers. Um, together we exploring the mycelium leather as a dress. Uh, it is shown in Jakarta Fashion Week, the largest fashion show in Southeast Asia. Um, and the third case is come from my friend who owns sneaker brand. So as a small brand, he does a business very good. He sold 10,000 pairs of leather sneakers every month. Uh, and they're doing pretty good job in creating a leather, uh, leather sneakers. However, he is struggling in uh, leather sourcing because the price is very volatile in terms of the price and availability. So um, it also makes their profit is pretty small. And since the leather itself is considered a very polythene material, uh, the consumer are start uh, pushing them to use a responsible material. So um, he asked me, like, is, it, is there any possibility to create leather sneakers from our mycelium leather? And back then, we, our product development is still um, is only in the early uh, beginning. Um, and the product itself is not good enough to mimicking a letter. So, so we spent a um, couple of months to develop. But after two years of development with him, um, we finally able to create mycelium letter sneakers. Uh, so um, to be honest, I'm pretty amazed. Uh, the material looks very awesome. And uh, after the brand turned it into the sneakers. Um, so I'm wearing it every day, the uh, sneakers, um, and also it's performed really good. It's also have a level of comfort, comfort uh, similar to the leather sneakers. And we're testing the materials using um, like an HDG standard, uh, some of the top, top notch uh, or gold standard for sneakers. And they pass, uh, so this thing is passed several tests on my TV standard. So we see there's a potential of using this material uh, as a sneakers or footwear, because we see 50% of leather in the world are used for footwear. And we see um, potential for brands, uh, footwear brands or maker to explore this material as their sustainable, future sustainable collection. Um, and we're also surprised that before we officially released to the public, some wholesale buyer from Japan also interested to sell it there. And we, we will have a plan to launch the sneakers for the first time um, in August, ex exclusively in Japan. So people in Japan can uh, already buy it starting this August. Um, not only sneakers, we will bring more products, uh, collaborate with many um, boutique brands, um, and ready to be bought is August. And talking about the sustainability, um, it is our core value. Uh, and when we have a conversation with brands, of course, the first questions that they usually ask is how sustainable is your product? Um, so in order to do that, we did a greenhouse gas measurement in 2019. Uh, we try to record like one year of productions. We calculate precisely how much carbon footprint per square foot. Uh, and we constantly measure these uh, greenhouse gases annually with the help of um, Decor Group, Decorum Group, a uh, carbon footprint consultant based in Adelaide, Australia. Um, so these data is helping us to get a B Corp certification. Uh, we know that B Corp is also well known uh, to be used in the industry, in the Patagonia and several other company who are considering to balancing between the profits and the um, uh, benefit. And um, not only that, we also use this data for communication tools with a brand. So uh, we try to develop impact calculator 
so the brands will know exactly what is their impact after switching their material from animal leather to mycelium leather. They know how many CO2, water, and land they can, uh, they can save. And uh, yeah, during the pandemic, we are aware the fashion industry was severely hit. Retail are closing, workers uh, in our value chain was losing their jobs. Um, however, this is a really good moment for us to build back better after the post-corona, during the post-corona uh, event. Um, and I hope this pandemic has become a watershed for the industry to not going back to business as usual. Um, so we are inviting more brands to join our green recovery partnerships uh, because we believe together with Mycelium Letter, we can bring back the economy uh, while we are saving our planet. So um, since 2015, we are empowering local community uh, and promoting gender equality in our value chain. Um, we are partnering more than 200 farmers and the multiplier effect with 600 people, including farmers' family member. 50% um, are 50% uh, are of the farmers are women, um, and we are partnering with them in part of the value chain. We involve them to producing the substrate, the raw material from the agricultural waste. So um, by producing this material, not only benefiting brands to go uh, more sustainable, but also benefiting community in the value chain. Uh, we also apply fair wage policy uh, that above beyond region standard. Um, so our partnerships with brands are of course helping the most vulnerable group during this pandemic. And for example, um, Ibu Siti, so she's one of the farmers joining MYCL. And after joining us, she earns more income and get health coverage, which is quite uh, uncommon in the village. Um, she also knows uh, about aseptic methods to growing mushroom farming. And somehow this knowledge, um, the aseptic knowledge is helping her to survive the pandemic. Uh, wearing a mask and use hand sanitizer is not something new uh, for her. So we also recently conduct financial literacy workshop for the farmers. Um, we want to bring awareness about the importance of having savings during this uncertain period. And hopefully by having savings in bank account, even they don't have a bank account, uh, they can use the fund for uh, emergency fund or even her kids future education. So we believe that together with our green recovery partnerships, we can uh, amplify our impact in post COVID era. Uh, it will create hundreds of jobs. The multiplier effect is doubled um, and more women will have new opportunities to accessing uh, a job. Um, so um, yeah. Um, please join us. Uh, I know it's quite new technology, but uh, we see there's a huge potential on that. We're looking for and we're seeking for having a partnerships with brands, stakeholders, and any stakeholders like R&D um, um, or even investors. Uh, so please join us to grow sustainable materials uh, that helps people do more for the planet. Uh, I'm Adi, CEO and co-founder of MYCL. So looking forward to having a discussion with you guys. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Adi, for the very nice presentation. And thank you, everyone, for uh, all your participation and comments and questions. Uh, I will invite uh, David to also open his camera and microphone, and then we can start uh, our discussion. And the first question will be to Adi from my part. Uh, you've told about the good impact uh, companies uh, get um by using your materials and you gave some actual uh, hard data but i would like to ask you just about it uh, briefly but what is the societal impact especially in an asian context about uh, companies or entrepreneurship in that space yeah um so talking about the social impact um so this is something that we are um exercise for past five years um, and I think this is something that one of the advantage of the biomaterials um, is 
the the product itself is using <coughs> uh, BioBase, and we can partnering with uh, in our case in our technology we can partner with local community or farmers uh, in order to collecting the uh, agricultural waste or or even in the production side, and we also get inspired from uh, how the mushroom local mushroom farmers growing their mushrooms. So we in, get inspired from their, their technique and we uh, try to adapt in our um, production flow chart. And, and I think by get inspired from their method, we can um, accelerate the scaling up um, by tapping the local farmers uh, because we don't need to uh, introduce the new method, the new technology, we can just um, having a small adoption, just a small uh, adjustment on their uh, site, and then they can start supplying us. So the, impl uh, the impact to the society is really huge, particularly in Asia, because most of the worker in Asia, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, are uh, farmers. So we see this is a really huge um, opportunity for us, not only saving our planet, but also uh, giving impact to the community. Thank you. I have a question for David now. Um, what are the biggest adoption challenges? You start with a nice idea of having super strong proteins, but what is the pathway from you know conception to an actual prototype and then to a, an actual working product? Yeah, I, I don't. Adoption. When you say adoption, I think of like consumer acceptance and, and consumer adoption. I, I don't think that is the, the main bottleneck. Um, in, in this in this industry, um, looking at biotechnology, it's it's really quite a long and challenging journey just to develop the, the technology and, and build it out and get to the proof of concept and get to the yields that you need to uh, potentially take this to the next level and sort of be at a stage where you can be relatively cost competitive. Um, that is a long journey, and then you also have the scale up process, which is. Um, which is not easy. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of investment to, to build the, um, the facilities that are required to, to really scaling up the, the production of, of these biomanufacturing processes. At the moment, it would be great if we had uh, more sort of distributed biomanufacturing capacities with modular bioreactors and so on. We're not quite there yet. So uh, building those facilities at an industry, it, it, takes, it takes a lot of time effort and, and money. So. Um, the biggest challenges um, for adoption is, is simply getting to the point where you can provide enough material to be adopted um, at a meaningful scale, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you, David. A question to Adi, that is from Sarah. Um, many companies have uh, are active in the mycelium leather space. Uh, what differentiates you from the different companies? And... Uh, also combine it with Sinma's question, what is your technology? Can you explain it a little bit better? Uh, yes, um, so thanks Sarah for the <laughs> questions. Um, yeah, regarding what the distinguish between uh, us with the other competitors is, uh, yes, we are very respecting our competitors. They also have really great job in doing um, um, partnership recently with the global major brands. So we are really appreciate that. Uh, that makes um, the this material is um, more appealing for the brands uh, for doing the explorations. And for each company is actually having a, their own um, um, what is it um, method in order to develop. Even though they we have the same output, which the mycelium matter, but we have a different uh, method uh, in order to approach uh, the production. As I mentioned before that we are inspired from how local mushroom um, growing their uh, mushroom um, substrate and then um, and, and somehow this, this method is uh, very suitable in a tropical climate where we have a lot of huge contaminant from other mushrooms to grow. So, so this is something that we um, doing in the past five years in order to develop my cellular matter. Um, so we are, oops, turning off again. Um, so we have uh, several trade secret and uh, know-how regarding the, um, how we produce the material 
and also um, have tested on several products. Um, so, sorry, have tested on several raw material uh, that particularly available in Southeast Asia. So we are already figuring out how to reach the economic of scale, even though we are just producing a small quantity of productions. I have a question to both of you. Maybe David can start answering first. Um, both of you mentioned partnerships and uh, strategic uh, collaborations so that you market uh, your products. Is that the only way that uh, biomaterials and biofabrication can reach the market or is it possible for your companies or some other company to get the final product that reaches directly the consumer? And let's start with David. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely a possibility. Um, there's, there's no only way within this, this industry for sure. Um, that said, strategic partnerships, they, they do really help sort of getting you to market uh, fast, uh, a lot faster than probably you could do if besides all the biotech R&D and the scaling up, you would also have to develop your own sort of product production capacity and logistics capacity and marketing and communications and, and, and all, all the elements that are required to actually bring a product to market. Um, I just said that scaling up and sort of uh, R&D development is, is maybe the bigger bottleneck, but adoption is, is definitely not to be taken for granted either, right? You do have to tell uh, the story and, and do the marketing and the logistics and the communication. And there are um, established companies in, in the industries that, in which we operate, especially for us in the apparel industry that have um, often decades of experience bringing products to, to consumers. Um, and at the same time are, are really eager to work with these new types of, of biomaterials with more sustainable alternatives to the uh, animal and fossil based materials that they're used to working with. So they're really excited to, to work with um, biomaterial companies and for biomaterial companies, it's, you know, it's, it's a win-win. They can help you uh, get the material to, to market uh, in a way that's much, probably much faster than you would be able to do yourself. Now, that isn't to say that you cannot develop your own brand and, and release your own products. Um, you can even do both, take the experiences that you've learned from your strategic collaborations and adapt those to maybe um, bring also your own brand to the market. There's, there's many paths towards uh, bringing products to the market here. Adi, I would like to hear your take as well. Yeah, so I think uh, the partnership itself is will accelerate um, to bring this um, materials, biomaterials from R&D uh, R stage to the um, scale up stage. Um, um, so when we talk with um, many potential partners, either from downstream or upstream or even investors, uh, <laughs> of course, a typical um, um, process for doing the research for this new novel materials is required like 10 years. Um, but <laughs> we don't want to uh, have a response from the partners that or investor that, okay, uh, let me get back to you nine years after uh, your product is available to the market. No, we don't want to have that. Uh, but um, by having a partnership with them is actually a giving a, um, a mu much feedback for us in order to develop the materials and by having uh, small steps uh, to, to achieve a greater or bigger um, achievement, uh, I think it's also um, important for us. Uh, so we want to create um, excitement for the brands or partners or even investors uh, in investing in these materials because we see um, the impact is really huge and the consumer, particularly for the end consumers, are seeking a more responsible materials. Um, so yeah, I think that's what my perspective about the partnerships. We have a very nice question from Senthil uh, about how important is the feedstock choice for the fermentation? And uh, given that you might compete uh, with the food industry for, or food resources with other industries. So how does uh, MYCL and Spider, I will ask both, let's start with Adi, uh, think about that. Yeah, so regarding the feedstock itself, uh, we try uh, several agricultural ways uh, that is available in Southeast Asia. Um, I think uh, the advantage of 
um, growing this material in Southeast Asia is we have a lot of abundant raw material. Um, for uh, somehow, bio waste producers are seeing it as a, a potential. So not only it's, it's a waste, no, it can generate um, additional income from them. So I think um, uh, regarding the feed stock itself, we don't have any uh, difficulties in accessing in Southeast Asia, um, and for and somehow they're willing to co-invest with us uh, in order to build the production facility in order to utilize their agri waste. Um, so yeah, that's that's regarding the feed stock, and we don't comparing with the um, valuable feed stock for food. Uh, no, so we only focus on utilizing agri waste that has no value. Okay, David, how do you plan to produce thousands of tons of uh, protein without competing with the agricultural industry? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a super good question and a really important question, I think, for the entire biomanufacturing industry. Um, right now, we we still we leverage first generation biomass in the form of, of sugar from from sugarcane for our facility in Thailand, uh, dextrose from corn for our future plant in in the United States. Um, and in that sense, those feedstocks would compete with, with food applications. So it is, um, I think, very important for, for the industry as a whole to invest um, in, in making the transition from first generation biomanufacturing to second and even third generation biomanufacturing, where you can use uh, cellulosic feedstocks, convert those to uh, fermentable sugars for your fermentation process. This is all in the context of microbial fermentation process, which a large part of this industry is based on. Um, or even the feedstocks in the form of, of single carbon feedstocks like carbon dioxide, methane, maybe even electrochemically generated formate. If electricity would be free and abundant, there's, there's many ways to uh, generate the carbon that you need for, for your production process. But at the moment with this industry still sort of being in its early stages, um, it is very difficult to to use second generation feedstocks like uh, agricultural byproducts for microbial fermentation in a way that is efficient and allows for, for sort of cost uh, competitive applications uh, to be brought to the market. Um, the thing is with, with those kinds of, of agricultural waste products or by streams, you convert them to fermentable sugars, but there's, um, there's, there's all sorts of challenges with that in terms of the cost that needs to be added to that in terms of converting those, those that cellulose to, to sugars. Uh, that's an enzymatic process. Often those enzymes um, need to be made more efficient for that to, to really reach its, its full potential. And then there's also uh, issues with like purity of, um, of those kinds of, of feedstocks that um, hamper their application uh, right now towards um, microbial fermentation processes. So again, I think it's, it's super important. It's also something we're, we're thinking about and, and working with, with collaborators on and at Spyware, how can we make that transition um, over the long term to second and third generation uh, biomass feedstocks? Um, at the same time, I think it makes sense for, for companies coming into this space, uh, microbial fermentation, that they rely on, on first generation biomass, right? Again, scaling up and, and developing the R&D is, um, is, is, is quite a challenge for, for, for the microbial cell factory and the target product. If you also have to start worrying about creating new conversion processes for, for byproducts and waste streams to, to make sugars for your fermentation process, that adds a, a level of complexity that would be, um, that would be quite challenging. Um, that industry does not quite exist yet for, 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 for byproducts and waste streams. While we do have these very established uh, sugar industries uh, from sugarcane, corn, and sugar beets, obviously. Um, that said, you know, we want to sort of avoid, of course, what we've seen with uh, bioethanol from corn uh, over the last decade, where there's been a lot of criticism for the impact of, of bioethanol on, on corn prices, uh, the impact of, of simply um, the sustainable agriculture that is associated with the production of that renewable biomass. So I think it's, it's very important also for, for companies coming into this um, that, that start using those feedstocks to really go all in on the sustainable production of those feedstocks to go all in on sustainable agriculture and apply principles of, uh, of things like regenerative agriculture to make sure that the agricultural supply chains that that underlie these production processes are, are well aligned with the promise of, of general sustainability that a lot of these materials including ours promise so um, that means adopting practices like cover cropping adopting practice practices like crop rotations uh, low tillage farming 
uh, precision uh, fertilizer application and so on and so on. These are all solutions that exist. Often you have to pay the farmers a bit more to actually go out and, and apply those, those practices, but they really change the equation from agriculture, industrial agriculture for your feedstock being sort of this exploitative process to one that provides ecosystem services, uh, provides um, a carbon sink into the soil, um, helps restore the soil, and so on. So there's definitely ways to, to source your, your feedstock in a way that, that, um, that is beneficial for the environment. But over the long, long term uh, prospects over the next couple of decades, we do at some point uh, have to make that transition to, to second and third. Uh, and that's a, that's a grand challenge that I think as an industry, we should be uh, um, spending a lot of effort on. Okay, for our last question, I will uh, take uh, the most popular question from the Q&A from Sinma and I will kind of twist it. And I will ask both, both speakers to ask, answer briefly. Um, if you were starting a new company besides uh, your current activities on biomaterials, which sectors do you think would benefit most from new biofabrication materials? I will start with David. So, so not biomaterials, but a new sector in, in biomaterials? A new se sector in the industry, a new industry sector or a new biomaterial, uh, which, kind, which industry would benefit more from new biomaterials? Let's ask Oof. that. Um, yeah, maybe I would start a 80s company, <laughs> <laughs> NYCL, because I, I love the idea of, of, of taking these, these um, agricultural uh, byproduct streams that exist all over the world in, in different contexts and, and leveraging those to, to make value added products, in this case, using mycelium, an organism that is already well adapted to using those kinds of, um, of feedstocks. Um, and I think, I think that can be done uh, in many, many places around the world where you have these, these sort of neglected feedstocks lying around that um, might be considered waste in sort of the current uh, perception of, of how humans think about uh, what that waste is, but that in another process are a resource for, for crafting uh, value-added products. And biology, of course, is um, very good at converting that those, those, those atoms, that carbon, that nitrogen, that hydrogen that exists in that high entropy state called waste into more ordered formats uh, of high-value products. So, um, yeah, I would be interested in, in doing something along those lines, looking regionally, what are the opportunities, what are the uh, overlooked resources uh, lying around and, uh, and use that to sort of um, yeah, bring biomanufacturing a bit closer to its promise of uh, sort of distributed uh, local resource utilization practices. Um, yeah, I think that would be great. Adi, uh, if you started a new company, where would you uh, target which market segment? I'm talking to myself. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, so we did a product market fit for the past two years. And before we doing mycelium letter, we actually collaborate with EPA Zurich to develop uh, building material. Um, so we try to entering the uh, building industry uh, by creating a structural element using mycelium composite. It works quite well. The material work, looks quite well, but when we are talking uh, market penetration, it's quite difficult. The industry is very reluctant with the new innovations and the <laughs> regulate, it's highly regulated uh, industry. But after we um, introducing this um, mycelium letter um, and doing in-depth interview with the uh, market segment, targeted market segment, which uh, fashion industry, it, it has a more, um, um, it's more accepting the technology and the cycle itself, um, it's also quite um, rapid. So for example, when we are um, making this material, we send it to the clients by Sunday, Monday, uh, ship it to post office using envelope and then uh, in, in Friday, they receiving the material and by end of the week, they can creating uh, new products and in the next week, they can sell it uh, quite easy through, um, through their e-commerce channels. So I think in terms of the um, market adoptions, uh, fashion industry is having a more um, open uh, regarding this material and somehow the fashion industry itself is also um, uh, having a, a really huge impact to the environment. So 
by adopting this uh, sustainable material like uh, fiber and mycelium leather, I think um, it's, it's having a really good significant impact in the industry. Lovely. Thank you both for the very nice uh, presentations and discussion. And now I will pass uh, the microphone to Brian from HC Innovate for the closing remarks. Okay, thank you so much, Costas. Uh, I would like to thank our speakers today, David and Adi, for sharing their valuable insight and knowledge, uh, as well as for our audience today for en engaging with our speakers and sending in your questions. So uh, do take note that we'll be sending out a post-event email with uh, important information, including a recording for this webinar, as well as a copy of the slides that were shared by Adi and David. Uh, so do keep an eye out for that. So, uh, and with that, so we've come to the end of, end of our webinar today. Thank you all for spending your Wednesday afternoon with us. And on behalf of SG Innovate, I would like to wish you all a great week ahead. And we look forward to see you again at our next event. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Everyone.